Welcome to Research Craft, a series about how historians at all levels go about doing history and what we can learn from each other. I'm Robert Carl. Moving from converting one's dissertation into a first book onto a second book project is not a piece of our profession that I've ever really discussed. As my guests in this episode explore, the second book occurs outside of the kinds of institutional and social scaffolding in which we wrote our dissertations. Moreover, if we are talking about the second book at all, it's usually a chapter at a time, rather than about the enterprise as a whole. To talk through some of the practical as well as intellectual elements of the second book, I've invited on two friends. Patrick Iber is Associate Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A historian of 20th century Latin America and U.S.-Latin American relations, Patrick is the author of Neither Peace Nor Freedom, The Cultural Cold War in Latin America. His public writing has appeared in outlets including The Nation, The New Republic, Nexus, and Dissent, where Patrick is also a member of the editorial board. Beth Lou Williams is Associate Professor of History at Princeton University. An expert on Asian American history, she is author of The Chinese Must Go, Violence, Exclusion, and the Making of the Alien in America. Patrick and Beth both described their second book projects in the episode, but let me add some context about mine. My book, Forgotten Peace, Reform, Violence, and the Making of Contemporary Columbia, came out in 2017. Since then, I've been pulled in a number of directions, but have mostly been accumulating sources for a political and legal history of the concept of impunity in 19th and 20th century Columbia. Although focused on the second book, this conversation is valuable for any historian conceiving or writing a book project. Two additional notes as the episode begins. First, the episode description below includes a selected bibliography of Beth's and Patrick's scholarly and public writing, as well as other books that come up in the conversation. Second, there's no screen sharing in this episode, so you can productively have the interview on in the background as you go about another task. Beth Lou Williams, Patrick Iber, thank you so much for coming on Research Craft. Um, it's really great to see both of you and also to have this conversation, which I've been wanting to have for a long time. Once upon a time, I thought it might be a, a conference panel, and I did think about inviting the two of you. So I'm glad we have this opportunity to, to sit down um, and chat about a set of issues, challenges, problems, opportunities that we're all facing. We're all at similar um, points in our career. We all have children of various r ranges, um, but in that we're facing, you know, more or less a common set um, of challenges. So Beth, if you could get us started by summarizing your wonderful first book and then giving us a picture of where, what the new project is and where you are with it. Thanks, Rob. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you and to be talking through this. My first book, uh, which is called The Chinese Must Go, uh, it looks at the invention of the modern alien in the United States. And it does so through the case of Chinese immigration. And so I look at the role of uh, anti-Asian violence uh, in the West Coast in local communities um, and its role in creating federal border control and shifting US diplomatic relations with China. It centers around uh, an unprecedented outbreak of anti-Chinese violence in the 1880s in the American West. And it talks about how these local movements fermented change at the national and international level. Great, yeah, so it, it moves scales really, really nicely. Um, that's one of the things I like most about the book, um, similar to an approach I take in, in my book. Um, so for the new project, as I understand it, you're sort of going down in terms of scales, right? So could you tell us about the new project? Yeah, the new project, I think, in some ways, is a reaction to dissatisfaction I, I had, or sort of lingering questions I had coming out of the first book. I mean, really two different things. One was, uh, you know, the first book, I focused so much on the border. So I was looking at local racial violence, um, but my questions were all about how this violence shaped border control. And I think a lot of that was based on uh, the the previous scholarship on Chinese immigration that had focused so much on exclusion and the formation of the exclusion laws uh, because the Chinese are the first group to be excluded from immigrating into the United States. Um, and I think my dissatisfaction there was that I started realizing that the violence, but then also the conditions uh, did much more than exclude and that in order to tell a fuller history of Chinese in the American West, I had to look at more than just sort of that moment of entry or denial of entry. And I had to look more at the, the conditions on the ground. You know, the related sort of dissatisfaction I had 
with that first book was I was looking at an unprecedented moment of violence. And so by definition, this wasn't daily life. And I think I became dissatisfied by looking um, at dramatic, at dramatic moments that certainly, you know, are moments of change, they can be turning points, they drive policy. But what about all those other moments, um, probably the le less documented ones that constitute daily life? I'm interested in how sort of state um, regulation also impacts those moments. Okay, great. And Patrick, how about you? Sketch out the first book for us and then what the second project is. Sure, and Rob, thanks for having me on this uh, series. It's a series that I've benefited from as I've uh, begun work on my second project. And so I'm happy to be here in the hopes that what I have to say will be useful to somebody else. Uh, my first book was called uh, Neither Peace Nor Freedom, The Cultural Cold War in Latin America. And it was um, a book about the engagement of artists and writers and the sort of people that get described as intellectuals with Cold War politics uh, in that region of the world. I looked particularly closely at two groups of people, the anti-communist group of the Congress Cult for Cultural Freedom, which was sponsored by the CIA and other organizations. Uh, and then uh, a communist line group there's the World Peace Council. So <clears throat> there are familiar figures in there like Diego Rivera and Pablo Neruda that people are broadly familiar with and plenty of unfamiliar uh, characters that nevertheless played an important uh, role in the uh, intellectual life and debates uh, around uh, questions of freedom and democracy and socialism uh, in that period and in, uh, in that time. So that was the first project. So now I'm at work on uh, a book about the Ford Foundation uh, in the region, covering a similar time period, but with a different focus. Uh, the uh, book is provisionally titled Poverty of the Imagination. And the goal is to look at different frameworks that emerged for explaining problems of poverty and inequality. Uh, so each chapter is a, a group of thinkers uh, and, explores how their ideas did or didn't get embedded in, in institutions or find forms of institutional support. So it sort of takes us from developmental thinking to the dominance of neoliberal thought from the 1950s into the 1980s. Okay, great. Um, and let me ask you next, and Patrick, I'll start with you this time, sort of how this project came into being, you know, um, if I had asked you, your book came out in 2015. Um, so, you know, if I'd asked you four years ago or six years ago, um, what you thought your next project was going to be about, how would you have answered? I mean, I remember before, right before I finished my dissertation in 2009, I think I was like brushing my teeth one day and I'm like, this is what I want to write my next project on. And it's, you know, it's grown and evolved a lot um, since then. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear about projects that fell by the wayside, the way you, you sort of came to this new, this new project. Sure. Well, I think there is, I, I can certainly relate to the kinds of things that Beth was saying about, uh, about her project. Certain dissatisfactions from the first one, but really there's a process of sort of identifying loose threads, right? That there are things that we want to, that we still want to know uh, and that, um, uh, and that I wanted to answer for myself. You know, things that I wanted to understand better. And um, it has been a bit of a winding, uh, a winding path. I mean, the Ford Foundation was present in the first book. Uh, I mentioned the anti-communist Congress for Cultural Freedom that had CIA support. They also had Ford Foundation support through, throughout. And there were these little stories that were really fascinating to me um, that sometimes I, I blew out into articles uh, that, but didn't really make it into the book. I did an article on the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and the um, and a group called the Centro Mexicano de Escritores, the Mexican Writers Center, um, that you know looked at the sort of Cold War politics of this well-known institution for writers in Mexico that closed in the early two thousands but lasted for fifty years, uh, and you know had a kind of significant presence in the in the artistic scene there, and. Uh, what I liked about doing that kind of work 
um, was that in contrast to the CIA elements of the first book, the foundations seemed like they were more transparent and I wanted to get a little bit away from intelligence uh, history. So there were things that I wanted to avoid, things that I wanted to do. Um, there were certainly ideas along the way that got picked up and then abandoned. And I think, in fact, this might have been one of them. At one point I had an idea uh, that I would do something like this and um, I struggled to get it. I tried a couple times to get it funded. I couldn't get funded. Uh, I was in a couple of different jobs. I was in a US foreign relations job. So then I thought I was gonna do a project on like the moment of interest in world federalism, which I thought was more appropriate to a US foreign relations job compared to a Latin American history job. And then I moved to another job, which is more a Latin American history job. So I had to return to that and sort of <coughs> finding ways to uh, combine the sort of possibilities that, that my, careers, my career was offering led to me to go down some directions and then to come back eventually um, to this one. I think it clicked into place for me um, when I scaled it down from a sort of broader history of these different intellectual groups to their connections to the Ford Foundation. That was the thing that made it go from something that was too big and unmanageable to something that was of manageable, was big, but manageable. <laughs> and uh, and so I use the, yeah, the Ford Foundation are kind of the, the, the lily pads across the pond that I'm describing, right? And each chapter get, relates to that theme, even though that's not the only thing that's being discussed. So um, that's, that's what worked. And Patrick, let me ask you too, to what extent was it a consideration to have a US-based archive that's very extensive, that's very accessible, that's very well organized, you know, in some ways, maybe the one of the better organized ones yeah. in the world. It, it's not irrelevant. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, both of my books, I mean, my first book and this one, right, I, I combined the use of US-based archives with archives in Latin America. And often the US-based archives were the ones that were more fruitful for my research. Although I strongly believe in the importance of doing research uh, in, you know, for projects like mine in Latin America, you learn, unique things from that, uh, from that kind of work too, even if the archival uh, depth is not as, uh, you know, even if it's not as deep, right? You learn different things from the, the, the experience. So I'm not advocating for US-based projects about Latin America, there are real dangers there. Um, but it certainly, it, you know, it certainly helps given the changing life circumstances that I think many of us face around the time of a second book. Uh, that make us more rooted in, in place. Uh, it could be the age of children. I mean, obviously these things don't apply to everybody, right? We're talking about a sort of special subset of, uh, of people who are lucky enough to have uh, jobs from which to work. Uh, and, um, you know, and people have families at different times and do their academic careers at different times in our lives. But insofar as we're talking about the kind of uh, careers that the three of us are, are having, um, it is helpful to be able to leave for relatively short periods of time and return uh, with good materials to work from that I can then process at home uh, rather than needing really extended stays in, in other places. Right, yeah, this is one of the real classic sort of mid-career second book um, problems and the pandemic has exacerbated it I think in ways we'll, we'll, we'll get to um, in a moment. But Beth, let me ask you about how this second project of yours came into being. So far as I remember from, you know, conversations we might've been having, talks I saw you give in 2018, 2019, it's broad, the broad contours are about the same, but t tell us a little bit about the history of the project. Yeah, in some ways it came from um, a master's thesis that I wrote, um, which, you know, means that it has had a long, long roots. Um, I was writing, um, uh, you know, a short paper as a graduate student that um, got me into a different set of archives, uh, county level legal records for the first time. And what I was trying to do was sort of mimic the um, methodologies that legal historians working uh, with the history of slavery and Reconstruction and Jim Crow were working with uh, in the West, um, trying to understand 
the image of Chinese men as sexual deviants or predators, um, sort of in conversation with a history of sort of conception of a black rapist. So I got into new archives um, in this process, local county level archives. I found uh, them both amazing and completely overwhelming. Uh, you know, one of the things that was uh, amazing about them was that uh, I got to sort of hear Chinese voices in a way that I had not encountered previously. Uh, since there are so few archival sources from Chinese immigrants in the United States in the 19th century, that sort of come from their voice, uh, even though, of course, they are translated, um, you know, transcribed and in a particular setting that is court. Uh, so it was, they were, they were amazing. They were also extremely difficult because these court cases uh, are still held at the county level and um, many of them at the time when I started were in active courthouses. Uh, many were not indexed, some of them were not accessible. It was a real um, puzzle of a thing. I think also court cases are just by definition many, many different stories. Like each, each court case has multiple narratives within it by definition and then every court case gives you a new story and just trying to figure out how to deal with the, the massive archive uh, was challenging. So I put it aside as a graduate student, didn't pursue it, but it was sort of my idea was to come back to these sources and try to figure out what they could be. And I put that together with my, you know, the discontents I mentioned before, the focus on exclusion um, and the border over the interior and the, and the focus on sort of these dramatic um, unprecedented moments as opposed to the mundane. And so the second book is, um, I, I think of it as trying to actually understand sort of not Chinese exclusion, but Chinese inclusion. You know, how is it the Chinese migrants living within the American West were regulated, um, were under measures of social control, but then also negotiated these measures and these forms of inclusion. And in some ways, these county court records work great to, to help me understand that. You know, I look at things like Chinese suing the tax collector um, to sort of um, negotiate or to push back against discriminatory taxation of Chinese, for example. In other ways, these are still really challenging sources that um, give me only sort of snapshots. They're very local, they're, they're, they don't fall easily into pattern. And I think that the project over time has moved into other sources uh, as I'm attempting to tell a fuller picture uh, that's less sort of episodic or anecdotal. And I think that that accelerated, that process accelerated during the pandemic when I could no longer have access to my archives. I had uh, luckily already taken images of over a thousand of these cases, but then I couldn't follow up on any of them. I couldn't get back into the archives. Um, and so what was accessible to me was things, you know, published sources, statute books, uh, the laws themselves, court opinions, uh, things that are that are easier to access. And I think in some ways I was really disappointed and frustrated with that, but I think, you know, now I'm settling into it. And I think that in some ways these, um, you know, it's a productive conversation to sort of put in conversation these um, very local stories with these broader um, uh, laws, uh, prison records, you know, things like that. I never quite thought of it uh, this way until now, but there's a way in which sort of the pandemic did for U.S. historians or presented U.S. historians with a problem that has faced us who work on the histories of other regions, which is, you know, the physical disconnect from our, your source base became much more pronounced. Um, so, you know, I haven't been able to follow up on archival visits, particularly at the regional level, um, for years now. Uh, and similarly, like right before the pandemic started, a couple big corpuses of um, government, Colombian government publications became digitized. So both um, uh, Supreme Court decisions, but then also the congressional records. So all the debates, drafts of laws, um, and so on. So that's been where a lot of my research has been happening since right before, like immediately before the pandemic. Um, and I think that's a trend that, that's going to continue. It's been 
three years now since I was last um, in Colombia. I'm hope I don't know when I'll go again. Hopefully um, next year. Um, but yeah, this so this the pandemic has in that way, as you said, sort of strengthened this this trend um, towards the digital um, and so on. Let me pose a, a slightly bigger um, question that in some ways could have been where we started this conversation. And Patrick, I'll begin with you. You know, in what ways is writing a second book different from converting the dissertation into a book? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. <clears throat> you know, in theory, right? We've done a dissertation. We've done a first book, so we're supposed to know how to do this. Uh, uh, we're and and indeed, in some ways, we are familiar with the process. You know how to write a book proposal. You know how to send it out. You send it. But uh, on the other hand, we don't have uh, necessarily the same kind of guidance. I mean, some universities are quite good about um, you know about supporting faculty as they develop second book project ideas and have maybe some institutional support for getting outside advising on those kinds of things. And you, you might have colleagues around. Of course, many, uh, uh, you know, those of us who had career instability or people who are not in tenure track situations might not have access to any of those kinds of things. It might be fully uh, on their own if, they're, if they've got the first book through and are looking towards uh, a second one. And, and we've got to do the kind of the research part uh, on top of a broader set of other responsibilities, right? Whatever those may be, whether those are childcare responsibilities, whether those are teaching responsibilities, whether those are administrative responsibilities, we, we have to find a way to do this book, I think in smaller chunks than we did with the first projects. At least that's been my experience of it, right? Like you have to be able to uh, make progress in an hour or two hours um, rather than uh, uh, having, you know, like weeks ahead of you where your only responsibility is to, uh, is to put together, uh, to put together the book. That might not have been the case. I mean, at least that was the case for the dissertation, right? And the book, maybe you did that while you had other responsibilities, but in some ways converting the dissertation into a book was a process of editing. And editing, I found compatible with those kinds of activities. I mean, I finished my first book when I was an adjunct, right? And um, and uh, and it sort of worked, right? Like because the research was done, I didn't have support for the research. Particularly, I didn't have much support for the research, but I I, I could edit. I could edit a document that I already had and get that through. And eventually, I got onto you know tenure track jobs and. Now I'm very well supported and, and very fortunate to be in the situation that I'm in. I know that, but still all these sorts of changes through that period of time uh, have meant that it's been a kind of winding road to get to this spot. And I think in my case, and I don't wanna overgeneralize from my experience, but I think it did take finally, uh, I was able to secure some time where I could get, got a semester uh, and then another, another uh, year from external grants that gave me the mental space and to like figure it out. And then it kind of all clicked. So I think the biggest challenge for the second book intellectually and practically are related, which is simply to find the time in which to do this when you have so many other things that are pulling on your attention, um, including scholarly things and family things and, uh, other job related tasks. Right, right. And these are things that, you know, in my situation, I feel very acutely because I had that job instability after yeah. my first book came out, right. not before. And then the pandemic continued job instability. And now it's, it's kind of incredible to think I finished my PhD about 13 years ago, but it's been almost two and a half years since I stepped foot in a library. And that's yeah. largely because of the pandemic, but it's also because I teach at a virtual institution now and I live uh, in a city without a major university, or at least um, I can't access the library of the universities that, that are here. Um, so this is again, sort of forcing a different kind of chunking. It's forcing involvement with digital sources in a way that probably wouldn't be the case if I were in a more traditional um, teaching or research position. Cause I'm also at a virtual university that emphasizes uh, teaching above all else, which I love, but it's hard to think about you know, get that mental space to, to think about um, the project. Right, and sorry, just to add, yeah. before we turn things to Beth, another thing that grad school provides, is you have a cohort around you of people who care about the same issues that you do. 
now people, you know, you may be in a situation where you don't have regular meetings with your colleagues. That's another thing that COVID took away from us, just the sort of informal chats where you like process things by speaking. Uh, we had less of that. Um, and, uh, you know, many of us are at institutions where we're one of a small number of people, or perhaps the only person with expertise in, in our area. Hopefully we have other people with, 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 with related interests, but that kind of cohort uh, feature that at least some of us had in grad school, we're lucky enough to have in grad school, maybe that's less common now as cohort sizes have shrunk, but um, uh, that's another difference that, you know, introduces a level of challenge to the second project. Yeah. And Beth, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, one of the observations that you made to me when we uh, chatted earlier this week in, in advance of this conversation was just pointing out, and this had never occurred to me in this way, I, I mentioned it to Patrick, he didn't realize it either. With the second book, you just have fewer people reading what you're doing. It's a much more solitary activity in that way as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that maybe if you, one could combat this better than I have, but I, I do find it to be a much more isolating process to write the second book. I mean, I think in many ways, the dissertation, you, you have an advisor, you have a committee by definition, so you at least have a small group of faculty who are beholden to you to read and give you feedback and hold you to high expectation. Um, I think that then once you graduate and at that process of turning a dissertation into a book manuscript, people have varying degrees of um, feedback and support. But I've been encouraged that I've seen more and more opportunities for people to hold manuscript workshops or other sort of, or um, for conferences to foreground sort of people in this process of turning the dissertation into manuscript, which seems really helpful. So in contrast, I feel like this writing the second book, I feel like I've just been writing to myself um, I've, I wrote a fair amount um, over the last two years and barely any of it has anybody read. Um, part of that is my own embarrassment of the state of <laughs> the writing, uh, pandemic writing, not the best. Um, and, you know, and just knowing, holding myself to a maybe unreasonable standard of when I'm willing to have other people read. Uh, which you you know, which is a thing that you don't do as a student. I think I think as a student, you're expected to sort of hand over drafty things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it occurred to me in preparing for today's conversation that the last two things I, I've been work, or two of the last things I've been working on, you two are among the handful of people who've read one or the other uh, of them, and I can really count on one hand the number of people who have read them. Um, a lot of that's the pandemic, but a lot of it's just you know these competing life commitments and just being out of sort of out of sync uh, because of the pandemic and, and other life life factors. I was going to say the other thing that occurred to me that's really different um, between is just how much teaching experience I've had in between. Yeah. And I think that that is really shaping and it probably I hope in a good way. I mean, because I think when you're writing a, um, a dissertation and then transforming it, you're still usually it's still while you're in the process of becoming an educator and i think that i've learned a lot about imagining an audience beyond my dissertation committee that i'm speaking to and sort of how students react to different kinds of books and what readers can grasp um in you know um the pacing of things there's just a lot that teaching i think has helped um and so more years under my belt uh teaching yeah, Patrick, I think this is a great observation. What do you make of it? Particularly because, as you said, you've jumped, you've taught a lot of different kinds of courses and a lot of different kinds of areas. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And the other factor is that, at least in my case, I've done a fair amount of public writing over the last six to seven years. So you get used to thinking about different kinds of audiences and how you can reach those audiences. I mean, with my first book, I aimed at a kind of, uh, at, a, at the elusive crossover audience that I don't, that I didn't really hit successfully. Um, it wasn't a book that sold large numbers of copies, which is fine, right? And the book did everything for me, I suppose that it need, needed to do. And then- It did speak to a lot of different audiences. So it was yeah. a success in that, in that way. Yeah, I guess so. Although I feel like a lot of the people who 
study, even who study the cultural Cold War, haven't read it because it's a book about Latin America. That's not universally true, um, but I really tried to write a book that wasn't just about Latin America, even though it was set in Latin America. And uh, well, you know, it takes time. <laughs> People are busy. Look, there are books on my shelf that have been there for a few years that I still, you know, haven't managed to get to it. I have no, I'm not trying to express any bitterness. It's just that uh, you know, that my experience has been that when I want to reach an audience, I have to do it by writing shorter, shorter pieces uh, and I've written pieces for magazines and, and that kind of thing. You know, and um, some of those have have managed to attract a very wide audience. So one of the things that I realized from that is that part of it is just serendipity. Right. If you happen to hit a topic at a moment in which people are interested in that topic, it, it's not like you can't. I don't know write brilliant prose and generate uh, a huge amount of attention and vir virality out of just like the quality of your writing. Like the quality of your writing stays the same, but sometimes, like sometimes you hit the moment and the thing really takes off. So that's happened to me a few times and other times I've written things that I think are equally good that don't get as much attention. That's just part of it. I mean, you're, you're, processing, uh, you're processing things for yourself. And I think that one of the things that I've ex had to accept and have, accepted is that the audience for a book is a smaller audience that in some ways the thing that the book does is prepare you if you're looking for a lot larger audience it prepares you to talk about it to talk about the things that you learned to write about the things that you learned in different formats and different possibility you know different uh, different uh, genres um, and that that's where the audience will come you know and I, I felt like through the first book I had and the people still ask me to write things that are essentially drawn from the first book project. And I'm tired of it. You know, I feel like I've sort of drawn that well dry. And what I want to do is learn new things so that I can continue progressing uh, as a, as a thinker um, that, and that then I can share those insights. So I wanted to choose a topic that I felt like would generate useful knowledge uh, for other kinds of activities while accepting that the book itself is kind of a vehicle. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not expecting to get on, you know, fresh air or anything like that. Occasionally it happens to, to historians. Again, serendipity has a lot to do with it uh, and quality too, but, but um, it, you know, I, I, when you hear somebody on a show like that, it, it, there must be so many more people listening to the show than will ever read the book. Right. But the book, the publication, the research and the writing of the book made it possible for the person to do that and to get their ideas out that way. And in my own littler, smaller ways, you know, that's the that's the model that I have in mind for how to disseminate the results of a book project. Yeah, I guess there's also like negative, like the serendipity is not always a happy thing. Right. Like in my sure. case, it was the serendipity was I was writing a book about the origins of the FARC insurgency and the history of peace in Colombia, precisely when the FARC demobilized uh, and signed a peace agreement. So that has given me an audience in ways that wouldn't have happened otherwise. But now the sort of anti serendipity is that that peace accord has not been implemented and the security conditions on the ground are getting grimmer uh, and grimmer. Um, so I'm sort of, you know, as much as I want to sort of intellectually go to the next thing. I'm constantly being drawn to what's happening on the ground in Colombia now. Um, and that also informs the major non-academic work that I do as an expert yeah. witness for Colombian asylum seekers. So that's, you know, in some ways why I haven't made a lot of progress on the book in the last few years, because I have these competing commitments um, and my work, you know, has brought me to the present. It's brought me to different audiences, but it's also right. brought me to the present in a way that wasn't foreseeable when I finished the dissertation in the late, the right. late aughts. Right. Um, I mean, I wrote a book about left wing intellectuals and then I became one. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, and I wrote a book about Cold War propaganda at a time that it seemed like Cold War was over. But, you know, in the time since the book has been published, you know, it's people are, are wondering a lot about Cold War like situations and they're wondering a lot about the nature of propaganda. So we've moved from literary magazines to social media as the sort of uh, nub of where the, this sort of activity is taking place, but it's still taking place. I mean, states and large groups are still interested in the outcomes of, uh, how, of the ways that people think. Uh, so 
yeah, I, I feel constantly tugged toward, uh, tugged toward the present and sometimes have to push it back a little bit in order to make space yeah. for the book. And Beth, how about you? I mean, you have sort of a similar experience with anti-serendipity in a way as well, and that Asian American violence has become in the United States even, even more of a pressing issue and a sort of front page issue than when you published the book um, in 2018. So what's your experience been like that, both in the ways it's informing your academic work, but then also potentially pulling you away in terms of activism or forms of public writing away from the book project? Yeah, it's been a really strange experience um, because when I sort of devising this as a dissertation project and then as a book manuscript and then doing sort of the first round of book talks after the book came out, I felt like I had to start each uh, conversation with why anyone should care about anti-Asian violence um, and sort of a presentist thing. And then, um, you know, unfortunately, during the pandemic, um, there has been you know, new interest in anti-Asian violence because of the rise of anti-Asian hate in this moment and anti-Chinese in particular. Um, and it's been very strange and disconcerting, uh, to be honest, how, um, I don't know, in, after the shootings in Atlanta um, targeting, um, you know, Asian workers in, in spas, um, I sort of had an unrelenting unre uh, request to give what I think of as sort of diversity education lectures as opposed to book talks. Uh, and from all sorts, you know, universities, but also watch companies and the World Bank and just straight at hospitals. Um, and it's just very, very strange. Uh, I think that this sort of DEI work is is challenging and it's a sort of expertise that is not the same thing as historical expertise. And so I had to sort of figure out in real time how I wanted to engage what felt um, comfortable to me, what felt like a good use of history as opposed to a poor use of history, um, to think about the political implications of um, telling this history in a very different moment. Um, and certainly it was distracting as I was attempting to, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult uh, when other people are asking things of you as opposed to you asking things of your, of your work. Um, and I find that in many venues, whether it's someone asking you to, um, to contribute to a, a panel at a conference or, a, or an edited collection or whatever, but also when, when the media comes to you, they set a different agenda than you would otherwise. Uh, and I think I, I slowly learned to draw boundaries. Um, I decided to focus particularly on communities I thought of as my own. So that is uh, defined as the university here, uh, New Jersey in general, and the field of Asian American studies and to sort of set aside many of these other requests. And, um, and I think in some ways it's turned me for the second book, you know, more resolutely towards writing an academic book and just sort of leaning into it. You know, I'm just gonna write the book I wanna write um, to make the historical points I want to make um, and not sort of uh, aim for that crossover uh, space and I think there's something freeing about that and letting go of that. And I, I really like um, what Patrick said that it, that the book provides a platform for what you want to what you want to say to a more public audience. I think that that's true, even if you write a very academic book, which is what I'm planning to do right now. Um, that I can then decide how it is that I want to talk about it in the public. All right, well, let's change gears a little bit then um, and talk about what you've learned from the couple of years now you've spent um, writing the second book. So that could be either pieces of advice you've gotten along the way from others or hard won lessons. Um, and Patrick, I'll start with you. Okay, uh, yes. So um, last summer when I was beginning my leave process, I decided that it was time to update my research and writing practices. One of the things that I did was to watch uh, this series. Uh, and one of the things that I did there was to adopt um, DevonThink, uh, a database management software that's really good for historical 
work. Um, I'm really, really happy that I did that. It helps me to keep track of the documents that I have, uh, to search them, uh, to convert. I mean, I still, like Beth, you know, I had a lot of documents from a prior from prior research areas, that, uh, research eras, many of which were like JPEGs, and you know, so I pulled them all into searchable PDF now, and that you know, just having that kind of access and the ability to summarize text and things like that is really really helpful. And I can uh, just organizing more effectively all of the things that I have in one place has been a key part of driving forward the research process and making it more efficient. Um, the other thing I did was this, and now, all right, I don't have daily teaching responsibilities. My administrative responsibilities are much reduced. So how am I going to make the best use of the time that I have ahead of me? So I thought a lot about how to um, structure my days and how to structure my time. Uh, and what I have found is most effective uh, um, for me, um, well, what I found was that the, the days that I would feel the worst were days where I would plot out, okay, here's what I'm going to do between this time and that time, this time and that time, this time and that time. And it would include a certain amount of reading, you know, I'm going to read a book or something like that. But then the book would take longer than I thought. And it would spill into the other pieces of the day, like the writing time. And then at the end of the day, I would think, oh man, you know, I didn't get any writing. You know, I didn't get to my writing. That's the most important thing. I just read a book or I even didn't even finish it. And I would feel like I had, you know, I would feel defeated by my own to-do list, uh, much, less, much less the other things. And when we were talking about that, I was thinking about I don't remember who it was who said it, but that your, 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 your email inbox is a to-do list made for you by other people. And I think we all feel like that, you know, sometimes, um, but you have your own lists too, that, that, uh, that, you know, that you're trying to hold yourself to and you can't always do it. So what I found is more effective is to put myself with a block of writing, to start the day with a block of writing time that builds on whatever it was that I read the day before. Uh, and so I make sure that I make some forward progress with the manuscript and then I go to reading. So rather than reading and then writing, I do writing and then reading. And when I'm able to maintain that schedule without interruptions, that is much more effective for me and I feel better at the end of the day. So uh, I don't know if that's just, you know, I mean, everybody writes differently, so I can't prescribe anything for anybody else, but that's what has worked for me. And I, I tend to do use the sort of, some sort of like quasi Pomodoro technique, you know, where I take maybe 45 minutes and I turn off the internet and, uh, and just write, um, you know, do whatever I'm going to be doing in that block. And then I turn it on for 10 minutes and I like answer emails and then I take five minute break and then I start the cycle again, do something like that. I mean, there are other, you know, other people have other ways of doing it, but just some sort of sort of regular rhythm is, is something that I've also found helpful just yeah. for productivity. Those are the best days too, or I'll, I'll just set a hit timer for, you know, 45 yeah. or 50 minutes yeah. of what it, reading or whatever, and then go do the dishes for 10 and come back yeah. to the next activity. So, exactly. yeah. Um, Beth, before I come to you, let me, Patrick, I want to follow up. Um, you mentioned the other day when we spoke uh, in advance of this conversation that um, you had looked into other software programs like Tropy um, as yeah. well, um, maybe less for your own usage than uh, for your graduate students. But tell us you know, why, why Devon Think among the, okay. the options that you looked at. Yeah, um, so uh, Tropy is great software uh, and it's free software, which is you know the big disadvantage of Devon Think. Well, there's two. One is, if I'm not mistaken, it's only available for Mac. And the second is that it costs, I don't know, $250 or something, something like that. I mean, for me, that's well worth it. But for a grad student, it might be a different kind of calculation, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I just wanted to spend some time looking at the different options that were available to me. I've been using, you know, I don't know, when I started in grad school, I started with EndNote, I think, and then moved over to Zotero at some point. And so, you know, for bibliographic management, I had already been using something. But for sort of database management, I didn't have... I, you know, I hadn't had an organized system. Um, uh, I, I, the uh, ability of Devon Think to put together different for, different formats of documents uh, and to like manage and label them was something that uh, worked better for me than 
than Tropy, but Tropy is developing all the time, you know, and people should definitely check it out. And I did this too for, you know, I, was, I did, I went to my graduate students and I talked to them and said, listen, like a lot of, so I have some graduate students who are in the phase of thinking about, I mean, their work, they're sort of at the beginning of their dissertation phase. I said, now's the time to develop good practices and to make the investment in figuring it out, figuring out what kind of, uh, you, you know, what kind of software matrix you're going to use during the time that you're doing your research. Rob, words that you've used sometimes are sort of path dependency. Like once you start on one of these things, like you sort of you get a lot into it. Uh, and I'm not sure that there's a wrong answer, but I mean, I think the wrong answer is not to have a system. Yes. That's the wrong the, answer. The wrong answer is to use word is to just use word for everything. Like yeah, right, there are a yeah. couple of wrong answers, but yes, no, you're, you're right. There are, there's no single correct way to do things. Right. Right. But just to develop, to develop some sort of method that can help you keep track of all of the information that, you know, inevitably is going to be, you know, it's going to be coming, <laughs> coming in your direction and you'll forget more than you've ever Right. You forget more than you remember. So it's got to be there somewhere to be to be accessed and to be able to be revisited, but in a way that's systematic. So, um, uh, yeah, it, for me, Devin Think was the right choice, but I wouldn't talk somebody out of using Tropy if they thought that Tropy was was right. You know, Tropy and Zotero. Zotero has new features too. Like you can comment, I think, on the on PDFs now. Like keep all your notes on it. I mean, it's getting more and more robust all the time. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, learning, learning the software, taking the time to do that, that is going to slow you down for a week, but then it's going to speed you up for the next five years. So, yeah, I think one other advantage that Devin Think has over Tropy is the OCR integration. Um, but one little quick hack I can recommend um, for that is if you upload JPEGs to Google Drive, it actually OCRs them in the background without your having to do anything. So I was working on a piece a couple of years ago, um, Beth was the piece about crime in Medellin that, that you read um, before the pandemic, um, I needed newspaper circulation statistics. And I remember that I had seen them at the US National Archives in 12 years earlier or something, mm -hmm. in like 2008. Um, and I didn't want to, I had like 1200 photographs from that collection and I didn't want to spend like a day looking through them. So I just uploaded them to Google Drive, waited an hour, and then just did a search for the name of the newspaper and I found it. So, you know, there are sort of shortcuts you can use. I, I wouldn't simply rely on uh, the OCR within Google Drive all the time, but occasionally it, it has its, its uses. So that was the, the great, a great example of that. And Beth, how about you? You know, uh, advice you've gotten or lessons you've learned along the way. They needn't be sort of more workflow oriented. Just yeah, I feel like I'm still a student of workflow here. You know, I tried Tropy Rob under your suggestion years ago when it back when it was too glitchy. I just could not get it to function um, properly. And unfortunately, then I went back to um, more basic methods. But I, I still think that I learned things um, based on on the way that you've taught methods, just standardizing systems, you know, but I'm not at all sophisticated in that I use Excel <laughs> to try to keep track of some of these, um, these sources. That's what I'm recommending more and more, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it works for me. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly keeping track, I think. Um, I, you know, a workflow. Um, I think that the main thing, you know, picking up on the, the issue of being um, of having many demands and being uh, constantly interrupted. Um, I do think that I've developed better skills with dealing with that. I actually had um, my babies during graduate school. And so I, it's not that big a contrast to me, uh, the parenting aspect, although the pandemic, as we all know, was, a, was its own uh, parenting experience. Um, and I found that during the pandemic and given, you know, other demands on my time, um, part of the problem was, was just sort of once I put, put something down, I would lose my train of thought or my, you know, what I was chasing or what I was thinking. And so I more and more um, adopted something that I used to do just at the archives. So at the end of a day in the archives, I would always try to spend, you know, the last 10, 15 minutes of the, that precious archive time, uh, which is, you know, I feel like a sacrifice unto itself, 
to just stream of consciousness write down what I was thinking after I'd seen all of these sources. And it was partially just recognizing that you have to capture these things as they come to you. And so I did a lot of that uh, just in my daily writing now, where I will write, no, I'm, I do, you know, I do some writing that is actual book writing and then a fair amount that is just notes to myself, you know, like this, this is why this is here, <laughs> what is missing in the future, you know, um, what I think this paragraph is going to be about. And I found that lowering my expectations that I wasn't writing a paragraph, I was simply describing what the paragraph was about, you know, then I don't have to think as much about craft. Uh, and therefore I could do, you know, accomplish something in 15 minutes that would, um, you know, a paragraph that would that would actually take me an hour once I go back and try to make it into something someone else can read. And I think, you know, strategies like that just allow me to pick up threads again when I am able to return. That's really great advice and it's something I'll, I'll try very hard to, to implement myself as, as the summer really picks up. Um, one other question I had um, about the transition from the first book to the second book is about sort of the ways in which we either continue with or leave behind different kinds of framings, be they analytical um, or narrative. So Beth, you know, your first book uh, has this wonderful tripartite structure um, and also deals, as I mentioned earlier, really well, really thoughtfully with um, spatial scales uh, as a unit of analysis. To what extent are you gonna be sticking with spatial scales? And then, you know, what, I guess, you you hit gold, right? In the fact you had this tripartite structure. So what are, I, I, one way I framed this to Patrick when we, he and I spoke the other day was like, is how much is the second album gonna sound like the first album? No, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think uh, for people outside of my field, it's gonna sound very similar because I'm talking about Chinese immigrants, same time period, same place. Um, to me, it feels really, really different. Um, one thing that I've learned about myself is that I'm very, you know, slowly over time is that I'm uncomfortable with writing straight chronological history. Um, and with the first book, uh, you can see this in those two things that I do. One of which is to, in the center of the book are three chapters from three different perspectives. Uh, the Chinese immigrants that are expelled, uh, the vigilantes that expelled them and sort of these forces of law and order uh, within society. And this sort of tripart um, Rochamon sort of framing allows me to get away from a straight narrative, which I find so uncomfortable. Yeah, one of the other one of the other things I, I note about your book, in some ways, like it's a you're jumping around in time as well. So the the t expulsion of um, Chinese immigrants from Tacoma is one of the central acts of violence in the book, and it was interest. I hadn't sort of. It, when I first came across it, reading rereading the book um, over the past few days, I, I hadn't expected it to be so central. I hadn't remembered it being so central. So you come back to it in in a variety of interesting ways, and that's one of the um, best pieces of advice um, that I got about writing, actually from from Jack Womack, who was my dissertation advisor and was on Patrick's uh, dissertation committee as well. Um, you know, each chapter doesn't have to pick up exactly where the last one uh, leaves off. So maybe the most obvious thing to hear, but it was really, really sort of reassuring to hear it coming from him. So, you know, you have sort of, you're moving from point A to point B in the first chapter with one set of actors, but then to tell the story of the second set of actors in the second chapter, you know, you're gonna pick up sort of midway through the time, the chronology you had been dealing with um, in the first chapter. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate your point there. Yeah, I just think it's, to me, it's the way I think about history, that, that it cannot be contained within a single narrative, um, and it gets yeah. flattened yeah. if we do so. Uh, so the other ways I've done this in my work is, you know, I've written an article in which I tell a story twice, you know, sort of once from a social, sort of a social history of um, intimacy between uh, Chinese men and white women, and then a second time through the sort of um, their interface with the criminal justice of so sort of two stories coming out of the same set of sources um, about the same moment. 
And with this uh, next book, what I've done is it's it's a thematically organized, it's not chronological. And so in many ways, I am retreading the same time period right. uh, six different times in six different chapters, which has its own um, challenges. And I'm, I'm trying to think really hard about how to make this not too challenging for a reader to follow. Um, but again, it allows me to, yeah, to break that that pull of chronology, or I mean, I, it's still chronological within each chapter, mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, yeah. So I think just learning about myself, yeah. um, what what feels right has helped. Um, it's coming out in different ways. Sort of my, it's a consistent problem with chronology, um, but but I'm using different um, sort of writing tools to get around it. That's great. And Patrick, how about you? Um, what are some of the challenges around sort of narrative framing or you're like, oh, I should really get away from the way I approach or frame something in the first book for the second book? Yeah, um, you know, it's very similar to, to uh, very, very similar, in fact, to the kinds of things that, that Beth is describing. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that, I, that I liked about my first book when it was done, I mean, I think, I don't know how you feel about your books, but I think we have a, kind of curious relationship to them and that we're hyper aware of the things that we end up dissatisfied with about the books. But one of the things that I liked about, uh, about my book uh, was that it had this kind of layered effect where um, uh, I would alternate, most chapters would alternate between the, the communist aligned groups and the anti-communist groups and the intent the what I intended with that was to help the readers go through a journey where they understood the logic of the way that people's the people were behaving, even though they might disagree with one group or the other or or what. I mean, I wanted people to develop a historical perspective about the characters and the way that they were the way that they were acting. One of my dissatisfactions with some of the literature on the cultural Cold War was that by just following the anti-communist group, it either tended to lionize them or make them seem sort of sinister and ridiculous. Uh, and I, you know, I I thought in the end that it, by putting these things in kind of conversation, you could really understand the way that people were acting and that that was the task of the historian. So in a way, I've taken that insight and I'm now trying to deploy it with an even larger number of groups, right? Because I've got all these different frameworks, whether it's modernization thinking or marginality theory or the culture of poverty explanation. Each chapter, like with Beth's project, goes to one of those things. And so I'm repeating chronology, you know, like, well, you know, I'm, each chapter I'm back in the, back at the origins of the Cold War and here's where it goes, you know, over the next 20 to 25 years. I'm trying to step forward a little bit. I mean, there is an organ, there's a logical organization to the chapters as they sort of move forward uh, in time and, and the kinds of ways that they are acting on things. But, um, but there is a, that, that kind of sort of repeated, like, let's, 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 uh, you know, we'll peel the peel the layer of the onion one chapter at a time until we've got something, you know, at the core at the end. Uh, so I'm still working through that, but I think that the kind of layered interactions help each group. Um, it, it helps us make sense of the ways that people are 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 behaving, and I like it in the end because. It, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand one of the things I'm trying to do with the book in part for myself, but I suppose in part with the argument of the book is to understand the ways that ideas work themselves out in, into, into practice, how ideas become practice. Uh, and it isn't the case that there is a set of dominant ideas at one moment and then they stop being dominant. And then all of a sudden there's an, I mean, I guess there's the, you know, like the paradigm shift idea, right? But, but in something like the social sciences, what you have are competing schools that have you know, different kinds of influence in different places and they're strengthened or weakened by their interactions with institutions and with events. Um, so, you know, we've got a kind of stream and the, 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 I don't know, the thickness or the strength of each stream contracts and expands over time, right? So that's kind of the, in the end, that's the kind of 
explanations that emerge from this model, and I think it's an accurate one. So that I, I, you know, that's the kind of structure that I'm pursuing in the service of what I think is, um, well, at least what I hope is a is a good way of thinking about uh, intellectual the relationship between intellectual and political history. That's great. I really like that that hydraulic metaphor. Um, one related question. You, you, you may not be the best two people to ask this to, just given the natures of your projects, but because you're both writing about roughly the same time period that your first book was about. But I'm also always interested in chronological scale. Like when I taught modern Latin American history, I found myself being much more explicitly anti-imperialist um, and sort of politically radical than I am uh, certainly in my book. Um, because the book was only about 10 years where I'm lecturing about the span of 200 years of history and the new project um, that I think I'm working on or that uh, it's listed on my website, et cetera, um, is a history of Colombia under the constitution of 1886, which lasts until 1991. So I imagine I'm gonna be making these sort of, you know, less fine grained points and sort of broader critiques. I know Beth, you're, I think your new project is going you know, a little bit further into the 20th century uh, than your first book. So in what ways are you grappling with this? Yeah, it's a little longer. I start a little earlier, the 1850s, um, and go into the 1920s. Um, I, you know, I, I think that in some ways, it, it, when I was when I was formulating a dissertation, I was pushed towards something that was uh, seen as sort of doable, contained, <laughs> contained enough. And I think that was my, what my committee. Um, now, a little with a little bit more um, freedom, I find myself wanting to talk across a wider swath of time. But th there's sacrifices that are made there, right? I, I find that in some ways, um, I find that sort of regional scale and time scale seem to work in inverse first proportion. You know, so at this book is going to go over a longer period, um, but it is really focused um, more specifically on the Pacific coast uh, than the previous book was that spent some time in, in China and Canada and Mexico. Um, and I think that that is in part a reaction, you know, it's hard to do all of these large scales at once um, while, while keeping sort of that fine grained um, aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And Patrick, how about you? It's in what ways are you dealing with longer or shorter chronologies, if at all? Yeah, you're right that in my case, I'm I'm sticking to a fairly similar similar chronology to the uh, to the first book. I felt a little bit of pressure to uh, extend the dissertation, like bring it to the present uh, for the book in the, the epilogue of the of the first book. Um, and I feel, uh, speaking of, you know, hyper awareness of the things that you wished that you hadn't written in your, in your first book, that that's where I feel like I made a mistake. Uh, there are some things that I would like to take back in the conclusion of the, of the book, as it was bearing on uh, sort of current events that seemed like it seemed like a reasonable position to hold at the time. And it I, don't, I no longer feel that it was a reasonable position to hold. Um, and I should have known better. I mean, I could have known whatever, and whatever you can, it, it, it's, uh, we, we I, it, I suppose it's a sign of growth that I don't think exactly the same way that I did, <laughs> whatever it was that I wrote those words. Um, and it would be in some ways embarrassing if one never changed your mind about, you know, about anything, uh, <laughs> never had that kind of growth. Uh, but I think I'm going to try and resist it as a result. You know, I think that in some ways I'm going to, you know, to work harder, not to, not to do that particular move at the end of the book and try to say like, what is it, how it matters for the, uh, for, for the, uh, the present though, that, that won't mean that we'll lack for any significance for the present, but just not to try not to do the chronological work of, Jumping, jumping ahead, which would inevitably be more superficial, both because we don't know what the future holds, but also because the bulk of the, you know, the the bulk of the research is on a particular era. I can't like speed through the next few decades without really doing the research on them. But right. um, so I, I am I'm more convinced, you know, in a way that is I said, again similar to what you're saying, Beth. 
uh, that uh, I'm, I'll be satisfied to write the book that I want to write. Yeah, if I could add to that, I think my similar sort of pull, and not I didn't get pulled to the present, but I certainly got pulled into the fact that U.S. history's sort of narratives about race have been so focused on African Americans and on Black history, and I felt um, I felt like I had to frame this very different history within that history. And I think that that's something I'm gonna to try to resist in this next one, is to sort of try to think about this history in its own terms. It'll connect at moments, I'll compare at moments, but it, I, I don't think that I will feel as beholden, you know, as if um, to tell a history of say white supremacy, it has to, you know, end, um, in a history of anti-blackness. I think I'm sort of gonna hold it where it is and, and where my interests are um, more confidently. That's a great point. Um, I guess, what have you been reading recently or what classics have you been returning to, to that you've found particularly stimulating or helpful in terms of thinking about narrative or I guess like what's exciting to you in your fields or, or outside of your fields? Great question. When I wrote my dissertation, I had Victoria de Grazia's book, Irresistible Empire, was a real model for me. I thought this is a, I love the way that this book is written. I love the, the kind of, and um, I'm, I'd like to do something similar to, so similar to it. Uh, and um, uh, right now, um, Nick Colother's book, uh, The Hungry World, is one that is, you know, sort of adjacent to what I'm doing, I think is, uh, is nicely written. Uh, you know, Dan Immerwar had a book recently, uh, How to Hide an Empire, which I, I reviewed for the New Republic, and a lot of people are reading, which was really a successful kind of crossover. That one really was the kind of thing that people were buying for their parents for, you know, for, for Christmas, and uh, he was on fresh air. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm not aiming. I'm not aiming for that, but it is. It's a. It's a very well written book, and one of the things that I don't think I'll be able to do, and one of the things that he does there is, that I think is really key for like reaching those broader audiences, is to write short chapters. I don't know how many chapters that book is. Forty chapters or something like that. They're short, and shoot, like, but I'm writing, you know, another six, seven chapter long chapters. <laughs> it's not. I'm not doing. I can't do it. I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, uh, I guess I could, you know, think about breaking it down. I need to work with an editor on that, I suppose, but that comes, that comes later. I'm still in the writing uh, phase of things, but there are really nice examples of books out there that have managed to be, uh, to be successful. And I have some experience, I mean, writing short pieces that people will read, but, you know, it's a different, it's a different genre. It takes a different kind of I'm just, I'm at peace with it. I'm just, it's okay. It's okay that the book isn't going to be that. Yeah. One sort of intermediate model that I often sort of point out to people, though I don't know anyone who's actually followed this advice, um, is Pierre Glahesse's book, Conflicting Missions, has, yeah. I think it's only two chapters in the end um, that are sort of, they're not section, uh, section introductions, but they essentially function as that, where he really sort of zooms out and in just the span of a couple pages sort of talks about changes in Cuban, Soviet, or US mm -hmm. geo strategy. And I found that mm -hmm. to be a really compelling way of moving across scales and giving readers background information before you go back into the much more fine grained archival and, and oral history work that, that he did for that book. Mm -hmm. How about you, Beth? I've been spending a lot of time with legal history recently, which is not something I had training in um, and I did not read widely in it before um, for the first book. Um, so one of the books, I mean, I, I um, my colleague, Laura Edwards, uh, her work, I think I draw from a fair amount. Um, and then, you know, the other day I was going back to Martha Hodes. Uh, she has this book on um, uh, black, men, white women, I'm not gonna remember the exact title. You know, some of these legal histories, I think just trying to read um, folks that are dealing with similar uh, source base and how they're dealing then therefore with similar methodological problems, um, that's directed a lot of my reading. Although this morning I was uh, brushing up on, on tax law. <laughs> so I feel like you just, you know, you, you follow, um, I, I, yeah, you, you follow where things take you. 
It's the beauty of being a historian, right? That there's nothing that's outside of our domain, right? And so in theory, we should never get bored with our jobs. There are always more things to learn. Yeah, yeah. Well, concluding remarks, anything you'd like to add to the conversation? I'm, I'm glad that we could talk this through. I feel um, a little uncomfortable talking about how to write a second book when I haven't done it yet. <laughs> you know, I, I think I'm still learning, um, trying to avoid some of the things I thought of as problems and pitfalls with the first one. Um, but, you know, it, you know, one of the things I learned with the first one was it felt sort of arbitrary when it was done. You know, like what its final, having, sat with it and worked on it for so long, sort of the state in which it got frozen in time seemed arbitrary. And I think it's similarly, this feels like a really organic process and I don't see the end point yeah. yet. And yeah. so I'm still very much in this process. So it's, it's nice to talk it through with both of you. Great. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to acknowledge that it's came up a little bit earlier in the conversation, but that people have really different labor conditions under which they're they're working and uh i don't think that we've replicated it too much but i wouldn't want to be doing the sort of academic equivalent of first world problems uh in you know discussing the challenges that that uh, that i'm having or that others are having with the with the second book i mean as we know more uh more academics are adjuncts now than are on the tenure track or in contingent labor conditions and um you know i've i've worked in that sector and i've been on this side of things too. And there are challenges, you know, that there are a lot of things that when you're, you're, you're in a tenure position, like there are a lot of demands of your time and so on and so forth, but you have a kind of, uh, if privilege is not too overused a word, like it's real. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the, part of the structure of your life. Right. So, um, there are parts of this conversation that I hope would be helpful to anybody. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that people are dealing with really diverse sets of challenges. And, uh, and I think that it's important for our profession to think about how to support people to write second book projects, uh, even if they haven't ended up in the kinds of positions that I have. Right. Uh, yeah. I've, I've been thinking, Patrick, over the last couple of days of, of a, exchange you and I had, um, I think early in the pandemic about how we're only going to make it through this if we're there for each other. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate both of you being here uh, with this conversation, which has certainly benefits benefited me both in the sort of nitty gritty of daily research practice and workflow, but then also sort of thinking about the potential futures for my work, given that I'm in a very, very different professional situation than I was four or five years ago. Um, so, and I know this conversation will benefit others as well. So Patrick, that's a great note to, to end on. So thank you again um, so much. Uh, I'm so excited to just keep reading your work and keep this conversation going. Thanks so much for this series, Robin, for the invitation to be on it. This is great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Research Craft. Remember to check the episode description below for a bibliography of some of my guests' academic and public writing, as well as books that were referenced in the episode. Please subscribe to this channel so you get notified about new episodes. Research Craft is also now on Twitter at research underscore craft. You can find me at R.A. Carl, where I often tweet research tips that don't make it into these episodes.